Now that we have a name for this new kind of function, a vector field, um, it would be nice if we also had a way to draw a picture of, of a vector field. And the way that we'll draw a picture of the vector field will just be, uh, we'll just use the uh, idea that motivated uh, the idea of a, a vector field, right? This picture of debris floating around on the surface of a pond, and we record the velocity of all of these bits of debris. And in this picture, notice that uh, every time I drew a velocity vector, I drew it starting at the point uh, where the debris is located that has that velocity. So that's what we'll do when we graph vector fields. Right? We will, um, for some representative collection of points in the xy plane, we will plot the vector produced by the vector field starting at the point that we are plugging into the vector field. Of course, to plot enough points to get a good idea of what the vector field looks like, it takes a, a fair amount of work, even for simple examples, just because there are lots of points in the plane. Um, so for uh, one simple example, let's, uh, let's plot f of xy equals minus y comma x. So um, at this, let's start at the origin, because that's the easiest, right? At the origin, that's the point 0 comma 0. That gets sent to the vector 0 comma 0 which we'll just draw as a dot like this. OK, so now let's move over to the point, say, 1, 0. Now we can put these coordinates into our, uh, our output functions here. y is 0, so that's going to be 0 here. And then our x value that we're plugging in is 1, so that shows up in the y coordinate of the output as 1. So 0, 1. So we need to draw a vector going in the y direction 1 unit. Um, and actually what I'll do is I'll draw it, instead of being one unit long, I'll draw it half a unit long. Um, and the reason is just because draw, graphs of vector fields, oh, that's not even in the right place. I need to draw that at uh, 1, comma 0. The reason that I'm going to draw it half as long as it ought to be is because uh, graphs of vector fields get very cluttered because we have so many arrows that we need to draw. And if you draw all of the vectors as long as they really ought to be, it just it gets too cluttered and you can't see what's going on. Uh, so typically what you'll do is you'll just shrink all of the vectors by some constant factor to make the picture look nice <laughs> so you can tell what's going on. Okay, so next point, let's do, I guess, 2 comma 0. That's going to give us the vector 0 comma 2. And remember, I'm going to shrink that by half. So now it looks like this. Okay, next let's move up to, I don't know, let's do 0, 1 next. That gets sent to, now I have to be careful with, <laughs> I have to be careful not to forget that minus sign, so minus 1, 0. Okay, so at this point I need to graph the vector minus 1, 0, but remember I'm shrinking it by half, so that's like this. Okay, next up let's do, I guess, 1, 1. That's going to give me minus 1, comma 1. And remember, I'm going to shrink it by half. So that's going to look like this. And let's only do one more. I'm already, I'm already tired of plugging in all of these, plugging in all of these points. So at 2, comma 1, this is going to give me minus 1, comma 2. And remember, I'm shrinking that by half. So that's going to look like this. All right. Uh, so on the one hand, you know, this is something that isn't difficult. You just plug in points on a grid and plot all the vectors and see what you get. On the other hand, this is extremely boring. This is not an interesting task. Uh, no matter what the coordinate functions are, this is a, a, a drudgery. Since we're just doing the same thing over and over, just with slightly different inputs. But, you know, that's what we built computers to do, right? We built computers to do repetitive tasks with slightly different inputs. So let's see how we can graph, uh, graph a vector field using uh, a computer. Um, there are lots of different software packages that can produce graphs of vector fields. Um, the software package that I'm going to use most of the time this quarter is called Sage. If you're familiar with um, MATLAB, Sage is more or less an open source, uh, an open source reproduction of MATLAB. That's actually that's not true. Um, 
it's better to describe it as a mathematics package that sits on top of the programming language Python. Um, at any rate, uh, if you go to sagecell.sagemath.org, there's a nice uh, a simple uh, text field entry for using Sage. Um, and you can do a lot with Sage, but we're going to focus just on the commands that you need to plot a vector field. Uh, it very sensibly has the name plot vector field. And then, uh, oh, I need parentheses here. So we're calling this function called plot vector field. And then in parentheses, we put our coordinate functions. And then we have to tell Sage what range of x values and y values we want to plot. So you put those afterwards like this, x, comma, the minimum x value, and then the maximum x value. And then in a new set of parentheses, y, and then the minimum y value and the maximum y value. So for example, um, let's, uh, let's plot this. Uh, this vector field here, sine of x, x comma y doesn't make any sense. Let's make it x plus y, uh, comma cosine x plus one. Okay, so here is let's let me get rid of this. We're going to plot a vector field. Remember, we need to put our coordinate functions in a set of parentheses. So it was going to be sine x plus y, and then our y coordinate function was going to be cosine of x plus 1. Okay, and uh, Sage Cell, it colors the uh, parentheses so you can see when they're matching. So this set of parentheses matches. And let's go from uh, x from minus 2 to 2 and y from minus 2 to 2. Now this, this statement up here, x, y, x comma y comma z equals var parentheses and then in quotes x, y, z. Um, for now, just consider this uh, black magic that you have to put at the beginning of your Sage to make this all work. This is just telling Sage that you're using x, y, and z as symbolic variables as opposed to Python variables. What exactly that means, um, don't worry about it. Just put this at the top. <laughs> uh, and then hit the Evaluate button. And it'll spit out this nice graph. Okay. So what say, one thing you might notice about this graph is even though it's from minus two to two in both directions, it looks slightly wider than it is tall. I don't, you can force Sage to make it a square by saying aspect, aspect underscore ratio equals one. I don't know why it doesn't make the aspect, aspect ratio one to begin with, but at least you can force it to make the aspect ratio one. Uh, and so this is the picture that we get. Um, I won't really explain why this is the picture that you get, right? Sage has just gone through all of these grid points and calculated the, the resulting, it's used this formula to calculate the resulting vector for all of these different grid points, and then it's just all drawn them all. Actually notice that it has also shrunk the vectors. It automatically uh, computes a good scaling factor to shrink the vectors so that they don't overlap too much. So Sage is, Although the relative size of all of these vectors is correct in that right, these short vectors really are much shorter than these longer vectors, the absolute size of these vectors is not correct. Right? If we look at the formula uh, for some of these, like if we look at the origin, we're going to get uh, 0, 2 for the vector. But at this origin, right, the vectors near the origin here are not two units long. So Sage is automatically doing this scaling so that the picture isn't a mess, which is good, right? We want it to do that. Um, OK, so that's for a 2D vector field. Sage can also plot 3D vector fields. All you have to do is call the function plot underscore vector underscore field 3D. And of course, you have to give it three coordinate functions. And I've forgotten my parentheses again. And you have to tell it a min and max value for the x, y, and z directions. So let's look at an example like that. So let's plot this vector field. One thing that is kind of nice about, uh, so let's plot this one. So minus x, minus y, 2. And we're going to go from minus 2 to 2 in the x, y, and z directions. Um, so Sage produces this nice 3D plot that you can rotate, which is good because if you couldn't rotate it, it would be very hard to know what's going on. Um, notice that there is some color coding happening here. Sage automatically colors, uh, colors all of these vectors based on their length. 
right? So in this particular color schemes, color scheme, the dark, darker and redder vectors are longer, and the lighter and greener vectors are shorter. Okay. One thing that is nice uh, that Sage lets you do, at least in the 2D case, there's a problem with it in the 3D case, and I'm not sure why. But one thing you can do is you can actually name a vector field uh, rather than having to enter individual coordinates like coordinate functions like this. You can name a vector field, say like I don't know minus y comma x. So create a vector field as a vector and then plot that vector field like this. Right. So. Uh, at this point, right, it's no less work to type in my coordinate functions up here in my vector field than it is to type them in down here in the call to the plot vector field function. But um, something nice that this lets you do is if you define a function in terms of x and y, say x squared minus, I don't know, x times y, uh, you can plot the gradient of the function as a vector field without having to compute the gradient by hand, right? Sage can compute the gradient. So, uh, and it's able to do this because this call to f.gradient, this calculates the gradient as a vector field because a gradient is a vector field um, because a gradient produces a vector at every point in the plane, so it's a vector field. Uh, this call to f.gradient produces a vector field that Sage then passes along to plot vector field, and plot vector field knows what to do with vector fields, right? It plots them. Uh, so being able to uh, handle vector fields um, sort of as entire objects on their own is very convenient uh, in this way. All right, so that's how you can plot vector fields. Uh, I encourage you to go to Sage Math, uh, sagecell.sagemath.org, and play around with uh, plotting some vector fields just so that uh, just so that you know how to do it so that if you run into a vector field working on homework and you want to know what it looks like to get some intuition for what's happening you're able to produce plots of vector fields um, there are a, a couple different vector fields that um, have critical properties that we're going to study and that sort of show up in examples frequently that um, I'd like to look at. So the first one is a radial vector field. So a radial vector field is some kind of variation on this, x comma y. So let's plot that to see what it looks like. So x comma y, and let me get rid of this and change this to capital F. Okay, so what we should see is that th the larger the x-coordinate of our location, the larger the x-coordinate of the vector, and the larger the y-coordinate of our location, the larger the y-coordinate of the vector. When we plot that, it looks like this. And you can see why this is called a radial vector field. It's called a radial vector field because all of the uh, vectors point in the radial direction, that is, directly away from the origin. Right. So this is a typical example of a radial vector field. Um, Notice that we can, uh, there are lots of different radial vector fields um, that we can get just by uh, stretching the vectors in various ways. So if we multiplied this by 2, I think this will work. Yes. If we multiply this by 2, all of these vectors are now twice as long, but they still point away from the origin. Um, notice that you can't actually tell that they're twice as long because Sage has done the automatic scaling to make the picture look tidy. And so when you multiply these by 2, Sage also shortens them by another factor of a half, so you can't tell that they got any shorter. One thing that you could do to uh, see that uh, Sage really is changing the lengths of these vectors is we could divide this vector field by its own length. So you can get the length of a vector field by um, doing the vector field dot norm. That's the name of it. So if we divide this vector field by its own length, then all of the resulting vectors should be unit vectors. So they should all be the same length. And yes, that is indeed what we get. So you can see, if you have a radial vector field, you could multiply it by any function of the distance from the origin, and you'll get another radial vector field. So we could multiply this by, I don't know, square root of x squared plus y squared, oh, y squared, like this. Uh, this multiplication symbol 
you have to use explicit multiplication. You can't you can't just uh, soup, you can't just juxtapose those two symbols like this. Sage won't know that you want to multiply these, so you have to explicitly say that you're multiplying. Uh, so if we have a radial vector field and we multiply it by any function of uh, the distance from the origin, we get another radial vector field. In fact, I mean that's a boring function. Maybe let's do sine of I don't know how about x squared plus y squared, right? This factor that I'm multiplying on uh, at the end is a function of the distance from the origin, right? Because it's sine of the square of the distance from the origin, and Right. What we get is something that is still radial, it's just it changes as you move away from the origin. Okay, so that's a radial vector field. Lots of important vector fields are radial, uh, in particular if, in fact, let me, let's look at one more example. Uh, maybe the most important kind of radial vector field is a radial vector field that points inwards and um, is, uh, let's see, I need a power of three halves here. In fact, let me do this, f dot norm to the three halves, okay. So this radial vector field is going to point towards the origin instead of away from the origin because of these minus signs, but also I've divided this by uh, the third power of the distance from the origin so what this does is it, right, it gives us this vector, radial vector field pointing towards the origin. Um, and this is essentially the vector field for uh, a point gravitational source. Right? Gravity, is, gravity produces forces pointing towards the gravitating object, not away. Right? So that's why these vectors are pointing towards the origin instead of away from the origin. It's as if there's a gravitating object at the origin. And also the strength of uh, the force of gravity decays like the square of the distance from the origin. And that's what this exponent is doing, right? The square, the distance from the origin, I would need a, oh, actually I've, I've made a mistake here. I need a third power, a, yes, third power here. So the norm, that's the, of f, that's the distance from the origin. And I have a third power here. One of those powers um, make, shrinks the length of this of f itself to be length one, and then the other two the other two factors, the other two powers here, make it decay like the square of the distance from the origin. So that's why I need a cube here. Um, and so, right, this is a vector field for gravity. Ignore the vectors sort of squirting through the origin here. That's happening just because when you get really close to the gravitating object, the force of gravity gets very strong, and so even though right, this vector pointing up and to the right, it's actually starting below and to the left, but it's so long that it passes all the way through the origin. So that's just kind of an artifact, a numerical artifact. So um, the rest of the picture gives you sort of an accurate idea of what the force of gravity actually looks like. Right, it points towards the origin, and as you move away from the origin, it rapidly gets weaker, right, which is what gravity does, since it decays like the square of the distance uh, to the gravitating object. Okay, so enough about radial vector fields. The other kind of um, common vector field is a rotational vector field, and they're all variations on this vector field. So let's graph this one. Let me clean up this mess and make this our rotational vector field minus y comma x. And that's this. You can see why this is called a rotational vector field. It's because uh, it rotates around the origin. It's actually hard to tell that it does rotate around the origin because the vectors near the origin are very, very short, so short that they just look like dots. But if we divide this vector field by its own norm to make all of the vectors unit length, you can see that yes, it is actually rotating around the origin. Um, as with, uh, as with uh, radial vector fields, we could multiply this vector field by any function of distance from the origin, and uh, we would get another radial vector field. But I'll let you play with that idea if that's something you want to experiment with. One important variation is multiplying this by minus 1. So if we just stick a minus sign on that, well, that's just going to turn all of these vectors around, 
And so now this rotates the other direction around the origin.